My name is Summer Burton and I am with the regional literacy network called Literacy Link South Central. I am here today to talk to you about using gamification in the classroom, which is using gaming motivation to help motivate things or people to do things <laughs> that are not necessarily games. So a little bit about uh, myself and my organization. We are a regional literacy network that serves six counties. So much like Literacy Link Eastern Ontario, we serve a population of literacy and basic skills programs. We have a total of 24 in our area. We do literacy service planning and we're a partner in our local employment planning council, which is one of eight pilots that's happening throughout the province of Ontario. We're also responsible for doing things like referrals to our local literacy partners, uh, professional development sessions like this one, we design curriculum, and we do a whole host of special projects. And some of what I'm going to be talking to you about today is our things that were born of the special projects in question. So today's agenda, what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to get to know each other a little bit first. I've got a pre-learning activity that we'll work our way through. We're also going to be talking a little bit about what gamification actually is and the core drives of gaming. What make gamers do, act, think, behave the way that they do. Not only why they do it, but why it's really good for us if we know what they're doing and why they're doing it. Because any time that you try to incorporate a new technique into something you're doing, there's absolutely the chance that it could go wrong. Let's just talk about that. Let's talk about what it looks like when gamification isn't handled well. We'll take a look at some projects that resulted in some pretty cool training material that is available for you to use if you decide you like this concept and would like to run with it. We will talk about the tips, tricks, and key ingredients to do gamification successfully with your clients. I'll give you a couple of extra resources that you can take away with you to look at at home. And then finally, you can probably tell there's a little something something going on around here. <laughs> there's a lot of potential for you to come and do some playing. So I have a resource corner over here which has a lot of different uh, training material in it. You're welcome to leaf through it. Unfortunately, I don't have extra copies to give everyone. I'm very sorry, but all of this is available for free download on our website. So you're welcome to take a look and familiarize yourself with it. We also have a station over here with something called the Makey Makey that I will be walking you through. One of these booklets is a training uh, module about this particular tool. So I'll walk you through how to use it and why you might want to. Over here, we're going to let you take home some fun stuff with you by breaking apart a laser pointer and using how, learning how to turn it into a macro lens for your electronic device. So for a really inexpensive $1.50 a person, you can end up with a really high-tech gadget that you can then use to look at the world in a new way. What is your website uh, Literacy Link South Central. So I actually have business cards. What I'll do is I'll just have you take one right at the end rather than passing them out now. And it's got it right on there and I'm pretty sure I've got it on the back page of the PowerPoint too. So, and finally, a couple of basketballs. Anybody here a basketball fan? Couple of hands? Okay, so those particular basketballs, um, I'll be telling you about the curriculum that goes with them. Really nice, heavy math embedded curriculum that specifically attracts a younger audience of males who may or may not be super dedicated to going to school, but they're on the basketball court every single afternoon at four anyway. So they are dedicated to something. And so we're reaching out to them through that particular curriculum, which I'll walk you through. So the first thing I'd like to do is get to know a little bit more about you so that I know what our playing field is today. There was a small piece of paper sitting in front of your PowerPoint that looks like this and it asks you four key questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a note as we go because I, I think it's kind of interesting to speak back to that later. Got my version here. First of all, roles. I took a stab in the dark guess as to some of the roles that you might have here in the audience today. Uh, I've guessed that your hearts are literacy practitioners, frontline literacy staff. My cl clubs, gee, my eyes. <laughs> my clubs might be LBS managers or directors. I may have administrative support people in diamonds, and I may have literacy network or support organization staff people. And I'm sure that I should have an other 
category in here, but I ran out of suits. So <laughs> we're gonna go with those four to start. So uh, can I get a hands up for our hearts, our literacy practitioners? Whoa, look at that. All right. LBS managers and directors? One, two, awesome. Uh, administrative support? One. And literacy network or support organization staff? One, awesome, okay, thank you. Next up, are you a gamer? And to qualify gaming, a lot of times when people think about gaming, they think of that person who's sitting up till four in the morning in the dark with a video game console getting paler and paler and paler. That's not what gaming exclusively is. It is an element for sure. But we're also talking uh, the games that you may access through Facebook, like Candy Crush or those other little online games that don't take quite as much of your sleep away, I hope. Also Yahtzee, other board games. I was playing Clue with my daughter yesterday. That totally counts. So if you're a card gamer, if you play Euchre, if you're a board gamer, all of those basically count. So where are my hearts? Who plays just exclusively screen-based games? One. Uh, and who are my clubs? Tabletop and or card games pretty exclusively. One, two, three, four, five, six. Who plays both? And there we are. <laughs> All right. And who does not play games at all? One. <laughs> You're gonna today. <laughs> Just it doesn't appeal, which is fair enough. All right, our, the, the second to the last question. Why is it that you enjoy playing the games that you play? So there are many different reasons, but I've given you four, and I'd like you to try and kind of find where you think you might fit the best. So our hearts are people who like the immersive experience of a gaming world. Our clubs are those who like the fact that each time they play, they get better. They like seeing themselves improve. Uh, the diamond category is for those who really enjoy gaming as a way to hang out and connect with their friends and family. And our spades are those who like the competition. They're in it for blood. <laughs> All right, so who's our heart category in here? No, uh -uh. All right, uh, clubs. Almost half the room. Diamonds, there's the other half of the room. And spades, who do I need to watch out for? <laughs> there's a couple, there's always a couple. All right, and then finally, what is your understanding of what we're here to talk about specifically today? So gamification as a subject. You, if you're a heart, understand and use gamification techniques in your classroom. If you're a club, you're familiar with gamification as an idea, but you want to learn more. As a diamond, you've heard the word, but may not actually know what it refers to. And if you have just heard about gamification on your way in the door today, then you're a spade. So who do we have in here that's a heart? Ah, oh, you're going to leave inspired. Who do we have that's a club? Okay, perfect. How about diamonds? There we go, and spades. Okay, perfect. All right, thanks guys. I'm gonna keep this here for a second. So one of the things I can tell is that we have a mixed bag when it comes to, uh, oops, wrong way. When it comes to the knowledge and understanding of the baseline of gamification. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, gamification itself is often misunderstood and one of the reasons that it's misunderstood is because people think that gamification is turning your activity into a game. That is the most basic understanding and what most people would assume gamification is. It's not actually true. So gamification itself is the act of applying game design elements or motivations what motivates someone to play a game into your classroom to produce the same result that people who are driven to play a game, they suddenly become driven to do what you're asking them to do in the classroom. So really it's a bit of a psychological tool to be perfectly honest. We talked a little bit about who here plays games and what motivation um, drives you, I suppose, to play those games. I'm gonna get a lot into motivation in particular in a few minutes, but I wanted to mention that the fact that almost everyone in the room said that they're a gamer of some kind is very typical of North American society as a whole. 
So there is a North American Video Game Association that was about a year and a half ago did a survey and have decided that 54% of North Americans play some kind of screen game. Well, we don't exactly have data or anyone doing a survey of board gamers. I would say that, does anybody have a board game cafe in the town where they live? Yeah, a few nods. They seem to be coming forward in popularity a lot. A social gathering place, a place you can go and have coffee, you can play a couple of games, you pull something new you've never tried off the shelf. There's often a staff person there who can teach you how to play it. Or else they'll have board game nights where everyone comes to play one single game in rounds. Pandemic is a really big popular one in our area for that. So it has definitely jumped forward in popularity. On top of that, there is an international tabletop day that's celebrated in April of every year. And it's an international event. More than 80 countries um, take part in International Tabletop Day. There's usually more than 20,000 registered events <laughs> happening on this one day. So I bet you there's something going on wherever you live. It's really definitely something that's caught into the public consciousness as something that we enjoy doing. So one of the quotes that I popped up on our screen here is in reference to what I said earlier about gamification not necessarily being turning learning into a game. This is from uh, Brian, I'm going to have to double check my notes because I always forget his name, Arnold. His name is Brian Arnold. He's from the National University in California. And one of the quotes that he provided that I really like is, learning is not made into a game, but the features of games which entice players to engage are used to draw in learners. So it's just changing the setting for the same type of motivation. There are a surprising number of researchers who look at gamification and the psychology of gaming to figure out what it is that makes people tick. And one of the most famous is named UK Chow. UK Chow, if you were to Google him, and I suggest you do because he's got some really interesting stuff, um, you would find that he is sort of the grandfather of gamification research. And he has coined what he calls the eight core drives of gaming. The eight things that continually make almost anyone who returns to gaming over and over again do so. So the first is epic meaning and calling. And essentially it's trying to figure out what makes a person want to participate. Why would they care in the first place about playing this game? Then there's development and accomplishment. Most often this is measured with a score, with being able to do better than you did last time, with earning a badge. Very typical form of gamification focuses on number two here. Empowerment and creativity is particularly something seen when someone who enjoys gaming wants to explore an environment or a world. Our Dungeons and Dragons folks have a tendency to fall very heavily into being driven by this category. So when you can immerse yourself in an environment, a gaming environment, and do things to affect change, that's an empowerment and creativity piece. Ownership and possession is next. And for those folks who've ever played any kind of game where you have to defend your castle against an invading army or anything similar to that, that desire to not let someone else best you, to not let someone else, say, take your piece in chess, that is based in ownership and possession. Now, a few moments ago, I was asking about what motivates people to play, and a lot of you put up your hands when you were talking about the opportunity to be together with friends and family and make those connections. That fits in very nicely with the core drive of social influence and relatedness. Now, it's not just about connecting with others, but it's also about measuring your skills against theirs and again, about seeing how you can compare yourself to the way other people play a game. Scarcity and impatience. Lots of games, especially online games, use this particular tactic. So for those folks who've ever played Farmville or similar games to that, the absolute need to log on every single day to feed the cow, because if you don't feed the cow, it's going to die. 
And if you feed the cow every third day, you're going to get an extra coin of some kind. That plays a lot into scarcity and impatience. So there may only be an opportunity for you to do something at a limited time. You have to make sure you get in there. My daughter plays uh, some National Geographic game. I can't, oh, Animal Jam, it's called. And if she logs in and spins a wheel, on this game every day, then she earns diamonds and you can buy more, more animals or something with diamonds. But if you miss a day, then it, you can't get the diamond for that day. And it's only like every third day that you get a certain color of diamond, which lets you buy the dragon or something like that. I don't really know, but it's definitely about making sure that you log on so that you don't miss an opportunity. Unpredictability and curiosity speaks a lot to adventure games where you go on a quest and you have an opportunity to try something new and then something unexpected happens as a result and you go, whoa, I didn't see that coming. And it makes you want to play again to see what else might be around the next corner. And finally, loss and avoidance. Loss and avoidance actually is something that I spoke to just a minute ago as well. It's that must log in or you're going to lose out. Must play or you're going to miss out. Especially for games that provide you with points for the length of time you play. And you'll see particularly some online games will do that. If you don't log on, if you don't make sure you check in with your you know, leader on that particular game, then you end up losing out on some of the points you could have earned otherwise. So lots of different ways of getting to the motivation behind gaming. And generally speaking, people fall into many of these categories. We're not just driven by one or even two of these. So there's lots of different ways to look at them. This happens to be UK Chow's set of eight core game gaming drives. But I've noticed that when you talk to people just in plain language about what is it you like, about playing games, it almost always can come back to one of those things. <coughs> and that leads us to gamer psychology. So knowing that there are lots of different things that drive people to play games, and knowing that all of us in the room answer differently to some of the questions that I asked earlier means that we are all different types of gamers. And one really interesting way to begin the process of introducing gamification into a classroom is to find out who your class are as gamers. So there are many different tests that you can actually take online or have your class take online, they're free, and it tests what's called your gamer psychology. Gamer psychology is generally broken down into four key categories. If you are a colors person or if you are you know, one that does personality tests, you may actually see a bit of a parallel here, except that it's framed within the concept of gaming. The most famous one is called the Bartle test, B-A-R-T-L-E, and that's the one that I'm going to talk to you about today because it's considered the most mainstream of all of the different gaming psychology tests. So within the Bartle test, it breaks us down by asking a series of questions. There's about mm, 70, I believe, altogether that place you situationally, would you rather or would you rather? So very similar to other personality style tests. And it ends up with people being weighted within each of these four categories. So no one is ever 100% one of these. But generally what you'll see is a 60% something, 30%, 10%, it breaks down just a little bit after that. So there's definitely a clear leader in the way that they tend to approach a game. So the four different types are our explorers. Those are the ones who tend to like to figure out how things work. And they're the people that are usually on your trivia team on Friday night. <laughs> they're the ones that like to figure out what it was they did that made something happen. They most often like an immersive gaming environment, but they really like to know the answer to the question, why? We have the achievers, which you can see up there. He's our guy that really likes to play a game as long as there's a winner, and it can be him. If there's not going to be a winner, this person disengages because they don't see the point. <laughs> they, they want to be able to come out on top. It's very, very motivating. They're quite a, a driven, goal-oriented type of person. 
Then you have your socializers. Those folks are in it more for what we talked about when we were looking at our overall group dynamic here. So the ability to connect with others, they're the networkers in our midst. These are the folks that want to talk to one another <laughs> while they're playing a game, that want to connect with one another online. They're the ones that could, instead of playing Scrabble against the computer, are much more likely to try and connect and play Scrabble with an opponent who's located somewhere else in the world because they know it's a real person on the other side instead of just a brainless computer. And then finally we have killers. Killers are a little bit like our achievers, but they have a slightly different motivation. So while achievers really like to win, killers really like to defeat. <laughs> Very similar idea, but they don't so much care whether or not they win an overall game. If they have the maximum number of kill points in a game, that's good enough. They don't necessarily need to come out on top. They need to come out having beaten someone else. That's the motivation. So different gaming psychology sites will break this down. The killers are called aces. You know, they come up with different words, but when you read how they're describing them, you'll see the parallel. And what's interesting is once you kind of get a, a feel for your class, you'll start to see how the people that are clashing <laughs> probably one of the reasons why they're clashing. When you're starting to break people up into groups to do activities, you may think, oh boy, perhaps I shouldn't put that person with that person. Like two killers together, where they're just going to spend the entire time butting heads and not able to focus on the activity. So it gives you some tools that you can use to just be able to maneuver your classroom in a way that will help you be successful. The last piece that I want to mention of uh, background, and please know that I'm giving you an overview today, but ultimately there is so much great research on all of these topics that you can do a lot of reading <laughs> into each one of the categories, the eight core drives of gaming, the gamer psychology, and then this piece here, which is the three successful ingredients to gamification. Uh, as you can see, <laughs> It's not as easy as taking what the simplest elements of gamification are and popping them into an activity that you already do because ultimately making something someone doesn't want to do into a game will not make it something they then want to do. And that's one of the classic things when people try to gamify without fully understanding the psychology behind it first, why it tends to fail. So what we're really looking for are three big pieces. And if you get these three pieces together in the same activity, you'll get much more buy-in to a gamified activity in your classroom. The first is meaning. Putting a gamified activity together that doesn't relate to your learner's ultimate goals and make it clear to them how it relates to their ultimate goals loses a lot of impact. So there are lots of ways that you can provide meaning for your learner. In part, it can be having them help pick the activity itself, help design the activity itself, help tell you about something that they enjoy, and then you work those elements into the activities that you're doing. And if that's not something that you're in a position to do or your classroom structure would allow you to do, then talking with them a little bit about what we've talked about today, maybe in slightly plainer language, is a really good way to help them understand why you would even consider doing these things in the first place. So we have a gamified typing activity that actually looks a lot like a storytelling activity, a group storytelling activity. And the first couple of times that we ran it, people loved telling their stories. That part was great, but they didn't really get how it connected ultimately to the typing. And when we began talking in the classroom about the importance of good typing skills, especially for employment bound clients, and most of these folks were, it gave them an opportunity to not just be excited about telling their stories, which is hugely motivating for just about everybody, but also to recognize that their skills were increasing every time they did this group story activity. So it becomes more meaningful for the clients. Mastery. That's the piece that shows someone they're actually making progress. So one of the things that I think is really critical here is about not necessarily 
showing progress by comparing yourself to others. When it comes to mastery, and I would say especially in a literacy classroom, mastering a skill by getting any measurable bit better at it than you were yesterday is something that we should be celebrating. And when someone can see a gamified activity, allowing them to be better than they were the day before, so they're only measuring the yardstick is against them, not against the person sitting next to them, not against their family at home, not against something that they can't control. Suddenly they can see the fact that the activity you're doing is making them better, is putting them closer to their goals step by step. And the buy-in goes up incrementally. And the last piece is autonomy, and it's probably the most difficult one to achieve. It's about people doing it because they want to, instead of because they have to, or because you told them to, or their OW caseworker told them to, or whomever told them to. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this sort of psychology aspects that we talked about earlier is that these gamer psychology pieces are universally usable all over the place. So we're talking right now about how do I potentially use them in a classroom and we're going to look at a bunch of curriculum that aligns with this idea. But it doesn't just have to be in a classroom. It can be used for almost anything. Yes? It's possible that some of those options out in psychology that they can be exploited. I mean, you mentioned the, the cell phone game where they pretty much use Skinner Box technology. They only have you paying 30 minute spurts in order to get you hooked in. Right, yeah. Uh, could you, are there any potential pitfalls of that uh, in terms of gamification or? I would say because of who we are in the field we're in, no, for us, because ultimately our role is to help people improve their skills so that they can be successful in life and employment. However, absolutely anything can be used for both good and evil. And what's in, evil sounded very dramatic there. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that gamification is newer to the education field, but it is old in marketing. It's been around a long time. And in very simple ways, I am gamified every single time I go to anywhere that takes air miles because they're encouraging me <laughs> to purchase two instead of one because then I get five more air miles. Or they're encouraging me to buy this brand over that brand because this one offers me air miles and that one doesn't. It's a very simple form of gamification, but boy does it work. It works for a lot of people. So like anything, it can be used in negative ways too, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when addiction, addictive personality traits come into play. That's, no, that ramps it up a little more too. I'm a huge gamer. I probably a game in play and I know yeah. there's a lot of microtransactions, things like that, that causes yeah. the, Stay away uh, from the, money. the, the, the skeevy side, the darker yeah. side of, of gaming. And, Absolutely. And everything that we talk about and I show you today um, has been in investigated to make sure that we're not sneaking into that kind of territory but you know the more popular certain things get so i'll give you a quick example uh, virtual reality there are lots of virtual reality apps that you can download that will allow you to look at real life through your camera i'm looking at you and then because of the virtual reality app see something beyond just real life they are hugely popular in education. They're sneaking that way anyway. They're expensive to develop, so those of us in the public sector may have not quite as much access to them, <laughs> but I'll give you an example. The Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, they have their own virtual reality app. So you can pull it up when you go into the AGO and you can walk by a painting you think is really interesting and you can scan it and the artist will suddenly pop up in front of your screen. You can still see the painting and they'll say, you know, I painted this when I was in such and such a country and I, you know, it made me think of this and it's literally a video embedded in the virtual reality app of the real artist talking about their work. Remarkable opportunities, remarkable opportunities. There are lots of really cool ways that you can use technology, but then you also have the risk of getting lost in that virtual world and letting it take over. It's a great argument. <laughs> it's one of those things we could debate all afternoon. It's one of my favorite topics. So, um, moving on. 
Helpful gaming traits. So why would we even want to involve gaming psychology and gaming behaviors in our classroom? I would invite you to picture for a moment someone who has spent hours trying to beat a level in a game and is that close, that close. They, they figured it out. They know exactly what they have to do. It's going to take up yeah, 20 minutes, half an hour of pure dedication, and they know they've got it. You will never see a more dedicated person in the world. <laughs> they have drive. They have intense focus. They have learned a whole lot about what they're trying to do and are now putting that learning into action to achieve their goal. I mean, doesn't that sound like everything we want in a classroom? <laughs> Ultimately, it would be perfect if we could recreate that. Now, that takes a lifetime of developing that practice of gaming, so we're not going to be able to achieve something like that in a heartbeat, but it's sure nice and great in education if we can use it. Those who game, for the most part, have the ability to collaborate and work with others. Now there are, the, that person I referred to at the beginning of the session, those folks that are just very internal and they just want to sit and they just want to play their video game without actually talking to anyone until four in the morning. But most people that game, and most of the people in this room in fact, want to game in part because it provides an excellent opportunity to connect with other people. They're the ones going out and sitting at board game cafes and meeting somebody new over a game of Yahtzee. Or getting together after Thanksgiving dinner and instead of everybody going their separate ways is going to sit down and play a couple hands of Euchre. So there's a collaboration piece that is incredibly valuable. Uh, the, I already talked about the intense focus and the skill uh, development, but one of my very favorite things about gamers is that they fail constantly and they don't care. <laughs> Oh, they care for a few minutes. So a piece from the board game might get tossed on the floor. There goes the Monopoly game up in the air. <laughs> there goes, you know, a couple minutes of and then they reset the game or they pick the board back up and they go, well, that sucked, but I learned something from it and now I'm going to show it. Now I'm going to do it. And they try again. And ultimately, that is one of the most powerful tools. And one of the most amazing things that we can provide people in our classrooms is the ability to try something, fail in a safe place, and try again without there being large repercussions as there are in lots of other areas of life. So if it goes right, it also goes wrong. A couple of examples of gamification going wrong. The first is probably uh, one of the most common, and it is not taking into consideration that gamer psychology that we talked about, about what kind of drives your audience. If you never think about what drives your individual audience, then you run the risk of creating an activity that absolutely has a gamified element to it, but it's a gamified elef uh, elephant. Oh, it's a gamified elephant. <laughs> it's a gamified element that doesn't necessarily speak to what drives your client or learner at all. So as an example, when we talk about some people being very points motivated, some people being wanting to beat other people, they're the killers, some people being very driven by being able to be on a leaderboard up there at the top of that leaderboard. If you have a whole classroom full of people who find leaderboards incredibly intimidating and are sure they're going to be on the bottom of them and just don't really want to be looked at that way, you're going to motivate them for sure, but it's going to motivate them at the door of your classroom as opposed to motivating them to try harder. So not taking that um, psychological look at your classroom is one of the first most common mistakes that gets made. The second is slapping badges and levels all over everything. That was the very first piece of gamification that was ever translated outside of the gaming environment. So if you look back historically at gamification in uh, health literacy, in employee training, in again marketing, which is really the biggest piece of it, the very first thing that everybody does is makes things into levels. It's the first thing. It's the easiest. Or in, instead of chapter one going to chapter two, it's level one going to level two, and there's a badge on the page like you've just earned something by finishing reading this chapter. Yes? Can they milestones? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a little. <laughs> 
the uh, the calling it a level, a badge, an urn, a win, a three-point system, a stars, like any of those kind of things. In some circumstances, it's a great way to track progress, by all means, but slapping it on everything ends up being a bit pandery. <laughs> it, it ends up, it, you get caught is what happens. Like we're talking about gamification as a good tool. If you slap just a couple of gaming elements on stuff, your class is gonna know that. And they're gonna be like, oh, you're on that bandwagon now, eh? All right, now, now everything's a badge and everything's a star and I'm almost on level five, but they don't buy into it. Or they may come to expect rewards or badges as they, you know. If they're, mo if they're motivated by it, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it, but the expectation is sometimes you can do the hard work, but not get the, mm. the thing doesn't pop up or, you know, but that's okay. And the more you play, the chances are they may pop up again. It may. Scarcity. <laughs> you got to get in there. Uh, and the last thing that is a big challenge is the idea of popping gaming elements into a place that really just they don't fit. So in my example, I was joking about, you know, getting insurance quotes and somehow turning that into a game. Ultimately, you should not try to gamify everything. I'm not trying to convince you to do that. It's the wrong choice. You should not take every gaming element that we've talked about and put it in every activity. Pick a couple of things that seem to work for you and your audience. Pick a platform where it seems like they gel well and just give it a try. But if you throw gamification into everything, it becomes a little ridiculous. So let's talk a little bit about actual hands-on things that have been developed um, and used in literacy classrooms that are gamified. The first is one that I would call one of the sort of most traditional first places that people go when they think games and literacy, and that's an iPad app. It was one that was developed for the Brandt Skills Center. It's actually two that were developed for the Brandt Skills Center. One was on homophones and was focused on tricky words where the learner themselves had to use these words that you can see up here correctly in the sentence. There were multiple sentences with multiple different places where you could potentially use those words. And if they used them in the cor uh, correct place often enough, then they would get a little gold star, a little gold check mark. And they were done that particular section. They had mastered that word. In this case, it's small, but it says there, there, and there. The other one was a punctuation app. And it was sections of sentence with all the punctuation missing and then the punctuation and some extras in some cases lined up along the bottom and it was a drag and drop so you click or tap on the punctuation you think is right and drag it into where you think it should go in the sentence and if you got it right then you could move on to the next uh, sentence and it was timed unlike the first one which you had as much time as you wanted to do. They were both play tested within the adult literacy classroom both of them received good feedback from the learners but what was really interesting about it was that the learners behaved really differently depending on which one of these two they were doing. So when the class together in, on their own individual devices was working on the homophone app, they were talking to one another like, ah, I just got the there. <laughs> you know? Have you got the gold star here? Are you still on green? What are you doing? They were chatting back and forth as they were working on them. When the punctuation app was being used in that little timer was running, everybody just closed down and focused and worked on exactly what they were looking at. Where was that punctuation supposed to go? So again, when you think about from a psychological point of view what's going on with your learners, it's fun to see what almost sounds like the same type of product at the, end, at the beginning cause very different behavior at the end. The timer can be very motivating for some people. It can also be terrifying. Test anxiety can be a problem. But in something like this, where it was just to master something that they needed to learn how to do and understood why, they were able to use the drive of that timer to help push them along a little bit more. So the Argicopter, somebody said something to me about this um, today, actually, that they'd heard something about a helicopter course. Um, this is a course that was run through the Thames Valley District School Board that allowed a class of learners to build a drone helicopter, a quadcopter. 
So the word drone tends to get a bit of an eyebrow raise, at least partway around the room, and for good reason. What's interesting about that, though, is that the curriculum embedded the knowledge that people go drone, really, right into it. So while much of the curriculum for the Argicopter is mathematically based, there's also a fabulous section about ethics. And there's also a great opportunity to get up and build with your hands. And we know, working in a classroom, that sitting and doing something for a long period of time starts to lose people pretty quickly. The way this particular course was built was very back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So they had, as a class, this kit, completely unassembled, of an Arjucopter, is what it's called. And they did a tool sa safety session. And they did a little bit of a learning analysis about how they individually learned. And then they did a, an inventory of everything that was in the kit. And then they did an, a writing exercise. And then they put together the first piece of the Argicopter. And then, the, so back and forth and back and forth, very physically active. And it's just cool because drones, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting idea to get together and learn about physically how to build your skills at the same time that you're watching this thing that was a box of parts become something too. What's interesting is that um, the mathematical skills that were in there, I mean, I love math, but for the most part, if you were to say to, uh, you know, 20 year old young man who's been disengaged from education, employment, and training for the past four years, you know, it'd be awesome. Let's learn about perimeter and area. I love it. Let's do it. It's going to be great. You tend to get a fairly lukewarm response. I mean, they might do it if they have to, but it's not like they're excited about it. But if you say, okay, so there's this software, you know, we're going to fly this thing, right? Like for real, we're really going to fly it. And in order to fly it, we need to learn how to use the software. How the software plots the route that the helicopter is going to fly is using area and perimeter. So let's figure out how we can plot the path our helicopter is going to fly. Buy-in, <laughs> just like that. Because they get to see something that they spent weeks working on actually achieve its ultimate purpose. And they're learning all of this embedded stuff along the way. I'm gonna see if I can show you a little bit of it. So this is in London. This is the class's Argicopter, the very first time that they built it and flew it. I won't show you the whole thing because it does go on for a bit. They attached a GoPro camera to the bottom. Football field. <laughs> So now not only could they stand and see their helicopter going, but they also had the video off the bottom that they could take home and show their friends. And it's on YouTube if you ever want to see the full thing. Very motivating stuff. That's the school. So again, embedded curriculum for tool safety, mathematics, literacy, it kind of had it all built in. And they've run it several times. This is one of the truly more expensive courses that when we're talking about, you know, could I use it in my own classroom? You absolutely can access the curriculum. That part won't cost you. Um, to buy an Arducopter <laughs> is going to cost money for sure. Um, it was upwards of about $500 for the kit. So something that might want to be looked at as a special project or something like that. I know not, it was, it was definitely a unique opportunity. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> LLSC's maker modules, and that's a lot of what you can see over here. These modules uh, include 12 hands-on um, activities that you can do with technology. From a budgeting standpoint, not super expensive, which is really nice. Many of them are actually based on apps you can download for free as long as you have a mobile device. Some of them do cost a bit of money. So on the more expensive end is one of the ones that we're actually gonna be looking at when I'm done 
endlessly talking at you, which is called the Makey Makey. And the Makey Makey kit itself allows you to turn anything that can conduct electricity into a key for your keyboard. Sounds a little strange, but it's a fabulous science experiment and really gets people playing at the same time that they consider conductivity. Uh, one of the other more expensive ones involved buying a, a snowball microphone. Has anybody ever heard of that? So, yeah, <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> it's a, a podcasting microphone. You can get one for about 50, maybe $55. And uh, then using free software to record the stories of people in the class and then giving them a copy of their story so that they could share it with their friends and family. So lots of interesting ideas in there about writing your story, using literacy skills there, communicating with others, um, as well just nice to be heard sometimes. <laughs> and the, uh, the software training that had to go into that was a great increase in digital skills. So there's a whole lot of these different modules which I welcome you to come and take a look at. Each of them includes a pre and post visit activity, so the class themselves have a little bit of homework to do beforehand and then a little bit of homework to do with the teacher afterwards. Generally speaking, it would be a, a discussion about the impact of what they've learned built in, especially interesting when you get into conversations about things like 3D printing, because there's a lot of really meaty stuff to talk about, kind of like drones. Then we also have why I brought basketballs today. <laughs> this is uh, a, another piece of curriculum which invites people to play basketball as a way to increase their literacy and especially numeracy skills. I would have to say this is probably one of my favorite versions of gamifying something. And the reason why is the reason why we did it in the first place, which is when you talk about sort of appealing to people psychologically and not necessarily turning learning into a game, but figuring out what motivates people and using that, this particular bit of curriculum was developed to be used with an audience of young men who were not in education, training, or employment. But every single day they were showing up at the community center and they were playing basketball and they were doing it for quite a long time. So even though they weren't dedicated to necessarily attending traditional structured activities, they sure were dedicated to this. So rather than inviting them to come to a literacy classroom and take a class, we developed curriculum around these really super cool balls and brought it to them and said, do you want to play with these balls? You know what these balls do? These are called 9450 smart sensor basketballs. They have embedded sensors everywhere inside them. They look and feel just like a regular basketball, but with the free app that goes with them, you can tell exactly what's happening to the ball at all times. So you can tell your dribble speed. You can tell the strength of your dribble. When you take a shot, you can view your shot arc, your speed, everything is measured, your spin. You can do exercises where you are trying your dribble with your dominant hand, your weak hand, and then back and forth between the two. And everything includes a digital coach that tells you how to do better and compares your skills to the skills of basketball players who are professionals, which is what a lot of these folks are looking up to, right? So really interesting motivation, but the way that the um, curriculum that goes with it is built, it includes things like working together as a squad, as a team, figuring out your squad stats, talking about your arc ratios, whole lot again of all of this embedded mathematical goodness <laughs> that's wrapped around something people were doing anyway. And I think at the heart of it, that's one of the things that makes gamification successful. It's not trying to take your curriculum and shove gaming into it. <laughs> it's trying to take the things you want to teach people and figure out how to make it as appealing as the games that they're already playing. So where do we go from here in terms of gamification? I've shared with you some of the things that have already been developed. When I personally think, what could we do next? I know that Adidas makes a smart soccer ball. And when you talk about the universal game, and when we also think about the fact that we have a lot of English as a second language clients who've come from countries where soccer is king, 
I think it's a pretty great opportunity for us to consider how we can tie together literacy and ESL clients and speaking a universal language that is football. Escape rooms. Do we have escape rooms in our towns? Oh, I've got like six. <laughs> love them. <laughs> they're so much fun. And they're hard too. They really make you think. And they make you work together with your peers. And they take a lot of skills that you may use in the rest of your life and kind of force you to use them in a very different way inside that activity. So there's an opportunity for us to consider how we could use that as a learning tool. Minecraft, not quite as popular as it used to be, but there are some really cool educational Minecraft opportunities that have already been developed. And you know, I mentioned augmented reality earlier. Pokemon Go is certainly a big, eh, slightly less now, but a big driver and a big example of when augmented reality kind of catches someone's attention in a passionate way. It'd be nice to cash in on that. Google Cardboard, has anybody ever heard of Google Cardboard? A couple of yeses. It is literally cardboard, which sounds ridiculous, but it's a visor you make out of cardboard and then you slide your smartphone in it. So all you can see in your vision is your smartphone. And there is an app that allows you to record where you are in real life. So I could be standing on the hills of Scotland and I'm gonna record in a circle and then I'm gonna record up and down and all around, load that into the app. Somebody can slide the phone into Google Cardboard and there they are on the hills of Scotland. And they can literally look down, up, around, and see everything. In terms of a worldview piece, pretty darn cool. In terms of an opportunity to take someone a place that they would not necessarily be able to go otherwise, pretty darn cool. So I think there's lots of opportunities. Thinking about the games that you've played or even what you know people are playing, can you think of any others? Yes. Um, I think one thing uh, that game developers are starting to become a little bit more aware of is that they're adding academics to the game. Mm -hmm. So in their narrative and things like that too, they'll insert items that will get uh, players interested, say, in tangential learning. They're probably not aware that they're learning, but say, for example, I never knew what the Sephiroth is until I learned I played Final Fantasy. Mm -hmm. You know, you just add, and it ha doesn't have to be as, it could just be as simple as naming a character off of an important historical figure, mm -hmm. just things like that to en engender that interest. And part of what makes it work is that you weren't being told you were learning. Exactly. It's not something that's <laughs> it just kind of happens. It's just your yep. interest, the interest and the, the content are kind of intersecting. Mm -hmm. It's allowing that to, to cross as opposed to you need to learn this and we're going to force it, make it into a game mm -hmm. for you. It's more or less we think it's important that you learn history and we're going to introduce those elements into the game. Very cool. Any other gaming concepts that you could think of adding to education other than what we've talked about? All right. So bring on the engagement. This is where it starts to get fun. You've got a whole lot of tools that you've just learned, a whole lot of things that you now know. As a couple of reminders before you go back to your classrooms, things to keep in mind. Find out what makes your learners tick. Remember that not everybody approaches games or reacts to gaming elements in the same way. So doing that gamer psychology test or something similar, just to get an idea of what will work more successfully versus not with your audience. Uh, connecting the activity to the client's goals. Let them be part of the process. Help them see why you're doing what you're doing rather than just flat out throwing things in without them understanding the meaning behind them. Let them track their progress and their achievements because anytime we can see ourselves getting better, especially against ourselves previously, as opposed to against our neighbor who may have a different skill set, uh, it will be very motivating and provide a safe space for them to try something, fail spectacularly, <laughs> and it's okay. And let them learn from it and try again. Those are ultimately the key elements that will allow you to gamify within your classroom. Some additional resources that you can take a look at when you are back at your programs. Uh, first of all, a lot of what I've talked about today, if you want sort of a deeper dig on it, is available in the report Gamification and Adult Literacy. It looks like this. Um, it is available on the Literacy Link South Central website as a free download, so please do help yourself. Along with that, on the same page, 
There is a gamification essentials for educators handout. I did manage to snag a few of those. If they're gone by the end of our session, that's absolutely fine. And using gamification techniques to increase learner comfort with typing. It's not the snazziest title, but <laughs> you get an idea of what it's about. So those are available. Um, there are some really cool places to go online as well. So if you were to go on to uh, Captera, if anybody's ever heard of Captera, it's kind of like TripAdvisor for software. So it collects user reviews of different business software and educational software and posts them. So if you're ever thinking of buying software, it's a pretty cool resource to take a look at before you do. They have a blog that talks about 15 different gamification resources specifically for education. Really great stuff in there. Uh, the Gamification Research Network Bibliography. <laughs> okay, I really like it, but go pee first <laughs> and get a cup of coffee or something because once you start, <laughs> you're going to be lost. There is so much stuff in there. It's a bit of a rabbit hole. One thing leads to another to another and boy, there's a lot of great stuff in there. It really is a wonderful resource. As well, there's a bibliography in the back of the gamification report that I mentioned before too. And with that, I would like the opportunity to let you play for a little bit. So we have on this table the Makey Makey. Um, one of them is already set up and I've got a game loaded that I'll show you how to play. Over here, um, I will need you guys to watch me do this once. And then you get to break stuff, which is awesome. This is making a macro lens. If you have a, any kind of a device, an iPad, a, a mobile phone on you that has a camera lens on it, you can make some really cool up close photos. That's a $5 bill. Um, with a grand investment of $1.50. So I'll show you how to do that. And then over here, we've got the two 9450 basketballs with software on each of the iPads. So you can give them a try and see what kind of stats that they'll track, okay? So in terms of time, we are done at four. That gives us 20 minutes of playtime. Um, I will, however, say now, thank you so much for coming and joining me at this session today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. I hope you've got some great ideas to have fun in your classrooms and inspire your learners to achieve. You buy them in the pet section, which is why it's got little paw prints all over it. What you're going to do is unscrew the top like that. And then this is the breaking part. There is a black plastic ring in here. You have to break it. It will not come out. So you've actually got to break it. I've got several sets of pliers that will do it. Please don't hurt yourself. There we go. And then inside, once you've got the black plastic out, is this teeny tiny little lens, okay? If we put that over top of your camera, it will magnify 40 times. You can go on Amazon and you can buy one of these if you'd like. It will look a little fancier. It's also gonna cost you $45. Yeah, so the other high, high fancy falutin tool that we use is a piece of tape and a bobby pin. So <laughs> you can put the little lens right in the bobby pin, then the piece of tape. Does anybody have their device handy at this moment that I could steal? We've got the camera lens right here. It's just as simple as placing this lens over top of that lens on yours because it's raised. I'm just going to move the tape. Sorry so that it'll sit flat. And then what you will see through your lens looks horrible for now because you need to have something up very, very close in order to be able to see the fine detail. If I can get enough light in it, you can see my fingerprint there. What I'll do is I'll have you come up and actually try it. And if you want to take pictures, you absolutely can using your camera. And you can keep these lenses when you're done making them. So I welcome you to please come on up and start breaking stuff. So you've got eight seconds, seven seconds. How hard can you go? There you go. So now it's going to talk to you. I'm just going to hit close on that. It's going to tell you exactly how many dribbles you did, what your average power per dribble was.